Good afternoon. It is February 6th, just after 1.30. The council is back in session after our afternoon recess. And we have a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2444 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, Increase Somatic Services at Montgomery County Public Schools, and the amount of $1,168,672, the source of funds, is a state grant. Council action is scheduled for February 13, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business today. There are no speakers for this hearing, and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to item seven on our agenda. This is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2417 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, Behavioral Health and Crisis Services, Trauma Services, in the amount of $500,000. The source of funds is also a state grant. Council action is scheduled for February 13th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business today. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. We have one speaker for this hearing, Lauren Riley, if you're able to join us at the table. Is Lauren Riley here? Okay, I don't think she's here. This public hearing is now closed. Moving on to item eight. This is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY 23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program and Supplemental Appropriation 2452 to the FY 24 Capital Budget, Montgomery County Public Schools, Northwood High School Edition Facility Upgrades in the amount of $9,560,000. Source of funds is general obligation bonds and state aid. An education and culture work session is scheduled for February 29th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so at the close of business on February 22nd, 2024. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. We have one speaker today is uh, Jenny Umore here. Jenny Umore. She is virtual. Is Jenny Amore? She is not virtual either. This public hearing is now closed. Moving on to item nine. This is a public hearing on supplemental appropriation 2449, the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services. Ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America grant in the amount of one million two hundred fifty one thousand nine hundred seventy nine dollars. Source of funds is a federal grant. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this hearing. This public hearing is now closed. May I get a motion to approve Supplemental Appropriation 2426 from colleagues? Yes. Councilmember Jawando moves, seconded by Councilmember Lukey. All those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. That is unanimous and is approved, 11 to nothing. We're gonna move on to item 10. This is a public hearing on expedited bill 124, bond authorization. This bill would authorize the county to issue certain bonds and authorize the bonds and bonds previously authorized to be issued to be consolidated to be consolidated for sale and issued, sold, and delivered as a single issue. Council action is scheduled to take place later in the meeting. There are no speakers for this hearing. This public hearing is now closed. We now move into legislative day number three with request to withdraw bill 1223 police traffic stops limitations the safety and traffic equity policing also known as step act and now let me turn it over to council member Juwando, the sponsor of the bill who uh, is moving to withdraw thank you uh, very much mr president we moved a little more quickly than i thought so <laughs> so so uh just uh, give me one second here so uh, this is, as, as folks will remember, we uh, requested from the State Attorney General uh, a decision on whether the STEP Act, which is the Safety and Traffic Equity and Policing Act, uh, was permissible under state law. Um, appreciate colleagues working with me on that. And we got a, a response uh, several months ago. Uh, the bill was introduced last year, actually February of last year. Uh, that certain components of the bill were not uh, permissible, uh, namely the ones that would have created a secondary offense for things like a tail light out, uh, having a air freshener in the window mirror. Um, and so this today we are uh, withdrawing this bill 
Um, and we'll be introducing another bill, which I'll talk about momentarily. Uh, but that is the action uh, today. So with that, I'd like to move uh, to withdraw the STEP Act. Uh, there is a motion to withdraw. Is there a second to the motion? I second. It's seconded by uh, Councilmember Katz. This is, uh, if there's no discussion, a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, could you read the roll? Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sale? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albanese? Yes. Councilmember Albanese votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Um, Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Okay, that is unanimous, and uh, Bill 1223 is now withdrawn. We are now going to move into item 12, introduction of bills. There is one bill for introduction today. It was just prefaced by Councilmember Juwando. Bill 224, police traffic stops, consent search of motor vehicle and data collection. The lead sponsor is Councilmember Juwando. A public hearing is scheduled for February 27, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. Uh, let me turn it over to Council Member uh, Jawando and to uh, Ms. McCartney Green uh, should there be any additional uh, comments to make. But I'll first turn it over to Council Member Jawando. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I'm pleased today, uh, the day we celebrated Black History Month, didn't, didn't plan it this way, but it works out, uh, to introduce the Freedom to Leave Act. Uh, the Freedom to Leave Act uh, is just that it will prioritize the Fourth Amendment rights that we all have against illegal search and seizure uh, to reduce racial disparities in traffic enforcement and it will do that by prohibiting consent searches of a motor vehicle or a person by a police officer uh, a consent search is when you are pulled over or you're stopped and you are asked without probable cause that you've committed a crime or done anything wrong can I search your person or your vehicle. Under the Fourth Amendment, you have the right to say no. However, uh, many studies have shown that that right uh, is really not uh, able to be exercised in most interactions because of the significant power and balance uh, that is created uh, when an armed officer may ask that question. It's important to note also that 90% of warrantless searches in the United States, 90% are conducted through consent search. The vast, vast majority. Uh, as uh, a council member, I'm committed to ensuring the safety of all of our residents and using our work to also move us in a direction for more dignity for every resident. Uh, from my perspective that this in piece this piece of legislation is important because it will ensure that residents one are aware of their constitutional right of freedom to leave that's a very important thing and that after the business of a traffic stop has been conducted without providing consent for a longer prolonged interaction currently an officer can ask anyone if they can search their car during a routine traffic stop uh, this disproportionately in data shows nationally and in montgomery county impacts the black community and can be used as a tool to fish or to extend a traffic stop interaction. As I mentioned before, given the, the power differential, research has shown that the majority of people who are asked really don't feel that they have a choice and that they have to say yes, thus nullifying the voluntary consent. Uh, I've shared personally before and I'll do again. Uh, if you're a member of the African American community, this is not an issue that is foreign to you you know uh, about these interactions. Uh, when I was 19, working for the Montgomery County Police Department, I was pulled over over 10 times in one year. Never charged or issued a citation. Uh, was asked several times to have my vehicle searched. Some I consented to, especially early on, out of fear. It's not right. It doesn't produce safety. Uh, and it makes trust be eroded between certain members of our community. And it's not a good, efficient use of time. To that point, 
data from the Montgomery County Police Department last year showed that out of one out of every 205 traffic stops yielded contraband. That is less than 0.5 percent, less than half a percent of the time do these stops yield contraband. So they're not effective and they erode trust. The second part of this bill is that it would uh, require data reporting on traffic stops. Currently we don't know when someone stopped what the primary reason for the stop is, how long it lasted, and other items that are in this bill. County government, transparency and trust work better when we have more information. So there's several components in here about that. I look forward to continuing the robust conversation about this bill. Uh, I appreciate all those who have testified for the previous STEP Act, including many of our traffic safety uh, folks, and we look forward to the public hearing on the 27th. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Juwanda. Anything to add from Council staff? Thank you, Council President. I think uh, Councilor Juwanda summed up the bill um, in its entirety. Just add that it also has a annual reporting requirement uh, based on the data elements that are collected um, from the prior year on, on traffic stops. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your work. Uh, that bill, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Council Member Mink. Thank you, not sure what's going on with my button. Um, so I'm still doing my due diligence of going through the language and, and legal details of the bill and talking to stakeholders. But from what I've seen so far, and there is an excellent packet available online by Ms. McCartney Green, um, this is a good bill. And certainly I want to express my clear support for its purpose. Consent searches fundamentally are a waiving of a person's Fourth Amendment rights. And the key, as stated from a legal standpoint, is that consent has to be granted voluntarily. So theoretically, that means a person should feel completely free to say, no, I actually want to retain my Fourth Amendment rights. Theoretically, they should in no way feel coerced, obligated, pressured to say, okay, go ahead, right? Theoretically, that's the idea. But it is irrational, and this is demonstrated in research studies, to suggest that the presence of an authority figure like law enforcement does not persuade, induce, or otherwise lead someone to comply with commands or requests that they otherwise would not have, even even if the author is com uh, even if the officer is completely calm and polite, even if they inform the person of their right to refuse. People have a natural inclination to comply with authority. There is as Councilmember Jawando said, in all practical senses, an imbalance of power in an interaction between a member of the public and law enforcement. <clears throat> and we know that even when the intent is a legitimately optional request, this is often perceived as an obligation. That's why it works. That's why so many people comply. And again, there are also studies which demonstrate this effect. And as stated, we also know that there are huge racial disparities in who is asked for consent to search and in who says yes, or in other words, who does not feel comfortable saying no. It would have some investigative benefits to search every car all the time, but we have the Fourth Amendment for a reason, and it's not just because warrantless searches are an inefficient way to address crime. This country prioritizes residents' rights against uh, unreasonable search and seizure. That's why the Fourth Amendment exists. It is the right thing to do to make that a practical reality on the ground. And so I thank Councilmember Jawando for introducing this bill, and I look forward to working on it with colleagues and with the public. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Sale. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank uh, Council Member Jawando and the community advocates who have brought forth this legislation. I also appreciate the collaboration from Attorney General Anthony Brown, who clarified which aspects of the issue, of this issue where the county is preempted by state law. There's plenty of data out there that shows how consent searches during traffic stops disproportionately impact the black community. I appreciate the thoughtful work that our Office of Legislative Oversight has put into reviewing the existing data and research to provide recommendations and advice on taking action on this disturbing trend. 
In their most recent report in 2021, they subsequently studied racial disparities in over 300,000 traffic stops by the Montgomery County Police Department between FY18 and FY22, finding out that at the local level, black drivers accounted for a higher percentage of traffic stops, 30%, searches, 43%, and arrest 38% than the average percentage of the adult population comprising of 18%. Also, Latinx drivers accounted for a higher percentage of traffic stops 21%, searches 31%, and arrests 35%, higher than the percentage of the population that accounts for 19% of our population. As our, con as our county continues to grow um, and increasingly more diverse, we must consider proposals that will benefit communities of color and put an end to discrimination and harassment, especially when it comes to matters of public safety. Again, I thank Councilmember Jawando and our community advocates for bringing this legislation forward, and I plan to closely monitor this bill and look forward to working with our county partners on discussing and analyzing it over the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other colleagues wishing to speak. The bill, uh, Bill 224, is now introduced. Now we're going to move to item... 13 on our agenda, uh, call of bills for final reading. There are three bills for final reading today. The first is expedited bill 4623, OPT, SLT, bargaining units, pension and retirement adjustments. The Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee met to review this. Chair Stewart, uh, would you please share the GO Committee's recommendation? <clears throat> yes, um, so this bill would extend from January 4th, 2024 to August 7th of 2024, the deadline for eligible county employees enrolled in groups E and J of the employee's retirement system to elect to purchase credited years of service with their existing retirement savings plan or guaranteed retirement income plan balances. This was sponsored by uh, Council Member Katz and the GO Committee uh, unanimously recommends it to the Council. Okay, thank you. The Government Operations Fiscal Policy Committee has made a recommendation and therefore a motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sale? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albanos? Yes. Councilmember Albanos votes yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Okay, that bill is approved unanimously. Uh, Councilmember Sales, a very brief comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just wanted to briefly share. Um, I just wanted to thank the county executive and our volunteer Fire and Rescue Association for putting forth this piece of legislation that increases access to benefits for our hardworking volunteer firefighters um, who embody the values of service, courage, and compassion. Um, our volunteer firefighters have demanding jobs, and I'm so glad that we are in agreement to ensure they have the resources to thrive and succeed on the job and in retirement. That's all. Okay, thank you. The next item for action is Expedited Bill 4123, Fire and Rescue Services, Length of Service Awards Program for Volunteers Amendments. The Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and Public Safety Committees uh, met and recommend enactment. Chair Stewart, uh, one of the co-chairs, uh, could you please share the mm -hmm. joint committee recommendation? And if uh, your joint chair, Chair Katz, has any comments, I'll turn to him as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so this expedited bill would increase the, the amount of the length of service benefits to certain local fire and rescue department volunteers. As was stated, this was a joint committee meeting between Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and our Public Safety Committee, and we uh, recommend enactment, and I'm glad to see the Chief here, and thank you for your service um, and working with us on this. 
Chair Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I learned, as you know, years ago to take yes as an answer, <laughs> and that's what we're having here. So I, uh, I too, appreciate everything that the Fire and Rescue Service from the volunteers as well as career does for Montgomery County, and this is well deserved. Thank you. Appreciate that. I want to recognize Eric Bernard. Appreciate you being here, all of your work. I think we all shared at the Joint Committee hearing how proud we are to be the only jurisdiction in the country that has a signed agreement with our volunteers recognizing the commitment that we have made to those who have volunteered their own time and talent to serve our community to keep us safe we're very grateful uh, it's the best deal we've got as uh, chair Katz likes to say uh, and I have uh, repeated many times and uh, as someone who is here thanks to the response time of our first responders I just want to express my personal appreciation and all of our gratitude for uh, for your service but also for uh, the entire uh, community that you represent and the service that they provide to our neighbors and their neighbors, uh, which we are very grateful for. So uh, thank you for that. We have a joint committee recommendation and therefore a motion. Did you want to speak again to this? Okay, let me turn it to Council Member Sales again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Only um, just wanted to mention uh, we serve on the legislative committee for the Maryland Association of Counties. And this is one of our four legislative priorities to improve recruitment and retention of our firefighters. And so if there's any models or practices that we can replicate from the state, um, we would greatly appreciate um, being included in those recommendations and discussions. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a joint committee recommendation uh, and therefore a motion. Madam Clerk, could you please read the call? Uh, call could you please call the roll? You can read the call or call the roll. <laughs> I think call the roll sounds good. So if you, if, you, if you could do that, the thing, do the thing. Okay. Council Member Lukey? Yes. Council Member Lukey votes yes. Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. Council Member Jawando? Yes. Council Member Jawando votes yes. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Alvarez? Yes. Council Member Alvarez votes yes. Council Member Flying Gonzalez? Yes. Council Member Flying Gonzalez votes yes. Council Member Balcom? Yes. Council Member Balcom votes yes. Council Member Stewart? Yes. Council Member Stewart votes yes. Council Member Friesen? Yes. Council Member Friesen votes yes. That is also approved unanimously. Thank you very much. The next item, the, the final item uh, of uh, action here is expedited Bill 124, bond authorization. Uh, I see Mr. Howard has joined us. Uh, why don't we uh, first turn to him to see if he has any comments on it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And just I'll briefly reiterate what I said at introduction on January 16th, that this is a procedural bill that the council has to approve each year and reflects the prior year's um, uh, CIP decisions and authorizes the county executive um, and the county government to um, to spend the bonds that the council has already approved. So that's all this does. Um, the only thing I wanted to note is the that's different from introduction is that the impact statements have been completed for this bill. Um, the economic impact statement indicates a um, uh, in assumed positive impact on the economic conditions of the county. The racial equity impact statement finds um, that there is uh, it's indeterminate, and the um, climate assessment also finds it's indeterminate. Thank you. It's good to be one of the longest standing, if not the longest standing AAA bond rated jurisdiction in the country. We really appreciate all of the, the work and uh, commitments uh, of our predecessors for helping us to be in that position, which allows us to get a, a better deal uh, for the bond issuances, which sounds technical, but in reality it means more schools and transportation projects and community centers and libraries. Uh, things that our community leans on very heavily and things we're about to hear from our community how much they want more of. So uh, with with that, uh, uh, may I entertain a motion from colleagues to enact Bill 124? I move by Council Vice President Stewart, seconded by Council Member Lutke. Madam Clerk, please read the, uh, please call the roll. I'm going to get it. Yeah. Um, Council Member Lutke. Yes. Council Member Lukey votes yes. Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. Council Member Jawando? Yes. 
Councilmember Jawanda votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albanos? Yes. Councilmember Albanos votes yes. Councilmember Funding Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Funding Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Bill 124 has been approved unanimously. We're now going to move on, and the council will now take action on a resolution to consolidate previously authorized notes for sale and issuance as, as a single issue. I'll turn it back over to council staff. If you have any brief comments on this? This is just a companion to the bill you just passed, and they go as a package, but have to be approved as separate items. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consolidation of previously authorized notes for sale as a uh, and issuance is a single issue. Moved by Councilmember Lukey, seconded by Councilmember Katz. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Any opposed? No. Okay, that has now been approved. Okay, the council will now take action on a resolution to approve or disapprove provisions of a memorandum of agreement between the county and the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and Public Safety Committees recommended approval. Let me turn it over first to Chair Stewart for uh, her comments and to share the Joint Committee's recommendation. Great. Welcome back. Uh, so this resolution is to indicate the Council's intent to approve provisions of the Memorandum of Agreement between the County and the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association. Unanimous um, recommendation to Council from both committees. All right, we've got a ditto that and well said from the Joint Committee Chair, a ditto and well said from me, the Council President. Um, we, uh, the Joint Committee has uh, made a motion. Those in favor of approving the resolution, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. No one is opposed. That is approved. And thank you again to Mr. Bernard and to all of your members for their and your service. Next. Up for action is a supplemental appropriation 24-3 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service, FY24 Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association contract in the amount of $336,188. Source of funds is the Fire Fund Undesignated Reserves. The Joint Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and Public Safety Committees recommend approval in the amount of $355,688, which reflects uh, in addition, uh, which I moved and was approved, which I'll turn to the uh, Chair, uh, Chair Stewart, to uh, expound upon. Madam Great. Chair? Well, um, we Government Operations, Fiscal Policy, and Public Safety Committees uh, spent a lot of time together on one day, as you can tell, uh, on January 22nd. And I think this uh, action item, the special appropriation, elicited the most robust conversation that we had that day. It was centered around emergency vehicle operations courses and trainings for fire and rescue services. And I just want to thank everyone for the robust um, discussion that we had, um, and to Ms. Rog for her packet. As we discussed um, these trainings, as well as the department's overtime deficit and the need to add funding to cover additional classes, um, Council President Friedson moved um, and both committees agreed to adding 19500 to cover an additional emergency vehicle operations course that is required under the new agreement. Um, and this will be added if there is sufficient um, enrollment. This would amend the supplemental appropriation to total $355,688, and the source of these funds is the Fire Fund Undesignated Reserves. And this was a unanimous from both committees. Thank you. So you not only did you take yes for an answer, you got more than you even asked for. Uh, you can thank us later. Uh, I think if, if anything indicates our appreciation for the service is that we added more money for the additional uh, class that wasn't even uh, requested. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consolidation of previously oh, this is, no, I'm sorry. We have a committee recommendation on supplemental appropriation 24-3 um, to the FY24 operating budget that has been recommended by the joint committee. All in favor, raise your hands. That is unanimous. Any opposed? No one is opposed. And that has now been approved for $355,688. Okay, we're now on to our main event uh, here today where most uh, in the audience have uh, joined us. Uh, this is a public hearing on the FY25 capital budget and FY25 to 30 capital improvements program for county government. 
Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery College, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, WSSC Water, the Washington Suburban Transit Commission, the Revenue Authority, the Housing Opportunities Commission, and municipality and state projects. Projects in the six-year program include facilities for parks, recreation, roads, schools, community college, libraries, fire stations, mass transit, housing, police, correction and rehabilitation, general government, and other public purposes. I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. We know there's a lot of interest in a lot of projects in our community. Uh, each speaker uh, who is registered has three minutes to speak. We're going to call up uh, in panels. We'll start with our first panel, Roger Payton, Tony Mara, Robert Nelson, Jim Epstein, and Kit Gage. Please join us at the table. We will go in the order I've called you up. And when you're ready, Roger Payton, you have three minutes. The Park Department provides essential social, health, and environmental services at over 400 sites countywide. The county executive has proposed substantial cuts to the park CIP request, but I ask that you restore this money and fully fund the original request. Although that request would fund many valuable projects, I will speak here of only two, which might in some way be representative of the rest. First, the Lintonsville Civic Green will be a small park located along the Purple Line, just a block from the new Talbot Avenue Bridge, where it will serve as a shaded rest stop for people traveling the Capitol Crescent Trail. But it will also be located at the edge of a historically black community of Lintonsville. And it will feature a monument designed around the two main bridge girders of the old Talbot Avenue Bridge. That monument will tell the story of the community and its struggles, surrounded as it was by communities with racially restrictive real estate covenants and near the sundown city of Silver Spring. The old bridge played a paradoxical role in that community, helping to define and protect the community while providing access to jobs and shopping in the surrounding and to its residents, the more dangerous communities abroad. The park design staff has produced a gem. I urge you to go to the park website to look at the plans. They solve many design problems arising from its difficult location and complex program. And these solutions are environmentally sensitive, so much so that the park will serve as a teaching tool for the nearby elementary school. We have worked for the last seven years to bring this park into existence. The community played an important role in claiming the site by finding an alternative location for a transit power substation, which the Purple Line wanted to place on the park site. We worked with the Montgomery County DOT to preserve the girders of the old bridge when it was demolished. We worked with the park planning staff for many years to help design the park. And we have shepherded through the many bureaucratic steps needed to realize it. I hope this might be the last. Second, the Rosemary Hills Lintonsville Local Park is in desperate need of renovation. Its basketball and tennis courts must be resurfaced, its soccer field is worn out and floods at the slightest rain, and its stormwater management system needs upgrading. The D18 the D18 team has secured $800,000 in state money earmarked for this purpose. The park budget includes additional county money to help with the renovation. Both representative projects deserve to be funded, I believe. I hope that you will fund them and will fully fund the park's budget request. Thanks. Thank you. Tony Mara. Thank you. Um, my name is Tony Mara. I'm chair of the Coalition for the Capital Crescent Trail. And I'm here today to ask uh, the county uh, council to restore funding uh, for the uh, CIP budget amount that has been requested by the Parks Department and, and the Planning Board. Um, we are a local uh, community-based nonprofit. Uh, we have thousands of, of supporters in the, in the county. And our, our, our main mission is to preserve the, the trail, which is, as you probably know, the most popular trail in the metro area and probably in the country. And one of the reasons is because of the Parks Department's work in making it sure that it is maintained and, and upgraded and, and preserved. Um, and the Parks Department has given the county, I think, one of the great benefits of living in the county, which is recreation facilities, parks, trails. Um, uh, we, 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 are, we are just very fortunate. I think it, it helps people to like to live in the county, and it also helps us attract uh, people and businesses. 
um, because of the county's foresight, we, we do have this, this, this gem uh, in, in, in our midst. And I'm very concerned that the county executive's request uh, to basically slash $24 million from the, uh, the budget request is going to really help hurt our, 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 our park system. Um, and I'm very concerned, along with Roger, about the possible effects on the proposal to put the uh, Lintonsville uh, community green in place. Um, we at the coalition are very much in favor of it because it's going to be adjacent to the trail. It'll be a nice rest stop for people using the trail. It'll be, uh, be about a mile and a half from Silver Spring. People traveling from Bethesda to Silver Spring will be able to use it. But also for the things that, that Roger mentioned in terms of the community importance, we really support that. Um, and we're worried that, again, funding is going to perhaps uh, sideline this or jeopardize its ability. We're also concerned about a number of other projects, including the Rosemary uh, Hills Park. Uh, there's a number of projects about for restoring uh, trails. Uh, there's a lot of potholes that have to be f fixed up. There's some bridges. And, and also there's a number of Vision, uh, Vision Zero uh, goals that may be jeopardized. Um, so I really re request that the council consider very carefully, um, you know, the importance of the parks and, and, and consider how uh, important it is to ma maintain them. And I really request that you uh, restore the $24 million that the county executive has taken away or proposes to take away. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Nelson. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Nelson, a homeowner in Goshen and past chair of the Up County Citizens Advisory Board. Transportation is a top priority in Up County students, residents, and I'm here today to uh, advocate for some long-delayed uh, infrastructure projects. You know, when you see potholes developing in a bridge, you get a little worried and you know that replacement's needed. And that's exactly the case of the deteriorating Brick Road Bridge. If you're not familiar with this, it's a two-lane bridge, uh, no sidewalks, no shoulders, and it carries 12,000 vehicles approximately per day. And the inspection report indicated the bridge steel beams are in poor condition with areas of 100% section loss. And the costs of bridge construction are eligible for up to 80% federal aid. So I don't know, understand why the Brink Road replacement keeps being deferred. Now, previous capital projects in our area have maintained traffic flow, including another bridge over Brink Road called uh, Goshen Branch and the Davis Mill um, Road Emergency Stabilization Project. MCDOT plans propose a three-month road closure of Brink Road, and their detour is 7.7 .7 miles in length, and few people will likely choose that, and we'll probably see large volumes of traffic unsafely diverting onto narrow, winding, rural roads that were never designed to handle the traffic and unsafe and through my neighborhood. An alternative is a four-mile diversion over Davis Mill Road, which is a rustic road, to a very narrow Huntmaster where there's a one-lane bridge with a sharp turn. So my message to you today is closing Brink Road for three months is just unacceptable, and MCDOT must maintain traffic flow on Brink Road during the construction of a new bridge. Turning to another matter, Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller knows well the need for the Mid-County Highway as she worked on it on, at MCDOT. It's, you know, it's not equity if up-county residents can't get to down-county jobs because of traffic congestion. Snowden Farm Parkway is completed in Clarksburg, and so there are only 5.6 miles left to complete the long-awaited eastern arterial. Now, so let's enlist the support of the state of Maryland, and along with county resources to fully fund this project. For example, Howard County contributed $17 million, and the state paid $151 million for the recently completed Route 32 dualization that has a similar size project scope. And I know per from personal experience, having had an office in Reston for six years, commute over on the American Legion Bridge is horrendous. Northern Virginia Transportation Alliance recommends constructing a new Potomac River Bridge in the 35-mile gap between the American Legion Bridge and US 15 Point of Rocks, resolving the region's single greatest regional transportation deficiency. Isn't it equity for Montgomery County residents to have access to the great jobs in Virginia? Thank you. Thank you. Jim Epstein. President Friedson and council members, uh, on behalf of the Wheaton Urban District Advisory Committee and the businesses and residents of the Wheaton Glenmont area, I am Jim Epstein, the current chair, and we appreciate the opportunity to provide this testimony today. 
Uh, we want to thank the county executive and we want to urge and encourage your support for including a few of uh, the Wheaton's long-standing priorities in this proposal, which will uh, help to provide multiple long-term benefits for the community. These include the Wheaton Arts and uh, Cultural Center, the build-out of the Park and Planning Headquarters retail space, and the Amherst uh, BIPA Bikeway. Uh, in line with the county's stated prioritization of equity considerations, we cannot strong, state strongly enough the importance of funding the urban district's priorities. As one of the lowest uh, income population centers in the county and one with the greatest cultural diversity, Wheaton merits investments in its infrastructure, its commitments, and its commercial vitality, its arts commitments. Uh, so we also want to mention a few of the other projects in the 6th District that are near and dear and integral to the area. They include the Wheaton Regional Park improvements, the Glenmont Shopping Center redevelopment, and the renovation of the 4D Police Department building. Uh, specifically, the Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center was cited by the RESJ as a strong likelihood of advancing racial equity and social justice in the Arts and Cultural Center, while also providing equitable access to public good that is enjoyed in other parts of the county. This project will also include, increase the availability of affordable housing in and around the Wheaton Central Business District. They continue that it received five stars, indicating that the project strongly aligns with the Montgomery County's policy to reduce and eliminate racial disparities and other inequities. And of course, additionally, the state, championed by our incredible D18 team, supports this project by appropriating an additional $1 million to speed up the process. The retail space build-out in the headquarters building, we applaud the inclusion of $4 million to convert this uh, currently unleased uh, ground floor space of the park and planning building. Um, turning it into a safe white box space is important as valuable space has remained an eyesore for way too long and an unused asset and it needs to be made safe for usage and it's right in the middle of our central business district. Uh, the determination of the utilization should also allow for public input as well as short-term and long-term usages. Uh, that should also not include the 4D police department component on the ground floor there. Uh, which brings us to that police building. It needs significant improvements. In the interest of time, I'll just mention that you're considering adding money for an HVAC system, which it desperately needs. But the building in itself is in horrendous condition, and we need you to consider whether we're spending good money after bad or whether we're really going to do something about renovating that building. Thank you very much for your time and attention to these matters. Thank you. Kit Gage. Lovely to see you all today. Um, my name is Kit Gage. I'm Advocacy Director of Friends of Sligo Creek, which I know a number of you know about. Um, we're an environmental stream valley nonprofit dedicated to protecting, improving, and enjoying Sligo Creek Park and its watershed. Um, as you may know, we box way above our weight um, in terms of our numbers and our impact on um, the impact of our volunteers. Um, we've been cooperating with and advising and helping and whining at uh, Montgomery Parks for more than 20 years. Um, as a group focused on the relatively small watershed, um, we are a bit, a bit of a canary in a coal mine in terms of understanding uh, problems, risks, opportunities that include invasive plants, deer damage, deer damage, um, surprise native plant finds um, and other needs including what I'll uh, go forward with. Um, we do strongly support the restoration and passage of parks full budget uh, including the 24 million dollar uh, proposed cut. Um, because Sligo is under very heavy use by people as well as deer, um, we support uh, the planned infrastructure projects um, including the trails, including the bridges, uh, to make people's use of the park safer as well as facilitate uh, the use by people of different abilities. Um, with our concerns about the effects of stormwater and water pollution, we support reduction in the uh, number, amount, square footage of parking lots that are adjoining the creek because that makes a big difference um, in reducing pollution to the creek. Uh, further, we endorse the stabilization of Brashears Run and Bennington Road tributaries, which are in the, um, which are projects that Parks would like to uh, to do, and we completely support doing them. Um, 
We also support the removal of a remaining major fish blockage. I know you may be surprised there are fish in Sligo Creek. There are. There are fish in Sligo Creek. Um, and there's a big fish blockage, um, and Parks wants to get rid of it, and we do too. Um, additionally, we, um, we support funding for the removal, uh, the replacement, and to stop installing sin turf in the parks uh, and instead use grass turf. We want them to remove um, existing rubberized surface in playgrounds. I know they've got a policy now they will not put any new ones in, but we want to remove the ones that exist. Um, cost money. Uh, you can replace those with ADA compliant shredded wood, uh, as they've just done in the playground near me. Works great. Um, these efforts would improve, ch improve child safety and health as they use the playing fields and playgrounds and would remove PFAS and other pollutants that now go into Sligo Creek as well as others. We want parks to install recycling containers throughout the park. This, you know, is something of a no-brainer, but it's especially going to be an issue, for example, around where the Purple Line crosses Sligo. There are going to be a lot more people right near there, and we need recycling buckets. Um, we want parks, we want to encourage parks' uh, efforts in multiple languages um, to reach out to the population, complete the transition to electric leaf blowers and mowers, reduce regular mowing, um, and finally the climate emergency requires major tree planting, which costs money, and it's critical for the environment. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Our next panel is Eugene Ebner, Tom Newton, Anna White, Melissa Weidenhofer, and Dave McGill. Please join us at the table. You each have three minutes. And as soon as you are ready, Eugene Ebner, you're our first speaker in this panel. My name is Eugene Ebner, President of the Civic Association of River Falls. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the Montgomery County Council to discuss the need to mitigate flooding issues in our River Falls neighborhood. Our Civic Association fully supports the $1.25 million of funding included in the proposed FY25-30 CIP budget for the design of the River Falls drainage improvements identified in the county's June 2022 River Falls Drainage Study. We request that the Council provide this design phase funding and thereafter full construction funding for the designated projects once the design phase is completed. This will ensure a smooth transition to their implementation and avoid the risk of future damage to our community and further cost increases. These steps are critical given the risk that another severe storm event could once again result in extensive and significant additional property damage to homes, cars, and other property in our neighborhood and threaten the safety of our residents. The execution of these improvements will mitigate the severe flooding that has overwhelmed the River Falls community three times since July of 2019, including most recently in June 2023, due to major storm water drainage issues that originate from the existing substandard Rock Run River Falls drainage system. As noted in the county's report, when compared to other county communities with storm drains, River Falls experienced the worst flooding from the summer storms of 2019 due to the undercapacity, inadequate pipe sizes, and configuration of our storm drain system. The county determined that our system is so deficient that it does not even meet its own established 10-year storm event standard. The county's final report on the 2019 floods in our community's drainage system recommended two actions that would be climate resilient and also serve as a model for similar projects in other county communities. Bioswale best management practices to reduce runoff within the existing drain system and upgrades to improve storm drain pipe segments in order to meet a 10-year storm event. Fully funding these recommended actions and upgrades is essential to mitigate our neighborhood's flooding issues. As a welcoming and diverse 500 home community, including many young children, River Falls rightly expects that the county will provide the adequate drainage infrastructure and maintenance that the county's own standards deem essential to assure the safety of, safety of our neighbors, homes, roads, and properties. For all of these reasons, we request that full funding for the project's design and follow-on construction be provided expeditiously to implement the drainage improvements cited above. The inclusion of this line item in the county executive proposed CIP funding recommendations, which our community very much appreciates, further indicates that this project is one of the major capital needs of Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abner. Next speaker, Tom Newton. 
Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Tom Newton. I've been a lifelong county resident except for a few years in college. And uh, I grew up here uh, a Boy Scout. I did a lot of hiking on trails uh, in county parks. And I ran cross country. And uh, running cross country, you get to use the trails right behind your uh, school. And then for meets, you get to go to other schools and see the, the trails there. And I didn't realize it, but as a kid, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in this county where we have all these amazing parks and I got to see them all over the county. So then uh, I go to college out in California and I've seen a lot of trails all over the country, but I moved back here right after college in the late 90s. And since then, I've uh, been mountain biking more than uh, trail running. But just seeing both the, the Road Runners Club, they do a lot of events, um, the Boy Scouts, of course, and uh, but also uh, mountain biking organizations, meetups. There, um, the trail system here is second to none, and our county parks um, are excellent facilities for county residents. And I would say that the parks and the trails in particular give uh, the county and county residents um, several benefits. There are... Um, social benefits, economic benefits, of course environmental, and public health. Um, socially, it's a place where people can meet up. Um, I'm a coach for youth mountain biking, and so now I get to see these uh, young uh, student athletes, these boys and girls, um, grow up and um, they, they have challenges along the way. Maybe they crash or they have a bad meet, a uh, bad race. Um, but then their um, teammates, in, even teammates from other teams, other schools, are supporting each other, and it's great to see them grow uh, and thrive. I would say um, the public health benefits are clear. Uh, it gives people a place to go walk your dog, um, ride your bike after work, on the weekend, meet up with friends, um, and you can clear your, your head. So I, I think it's both mental and physical benefits of being out there and breathing the fresh air and hearing that. Um, babbling stream that's right behind your house and the trails give us a way to do that if you had just the the land that was there but no trail to go through it then it would just be sort of people making their own ways when they walk their dog but you wouldn't really be able to immerse yourself in the, in the uh, the parks and the natural environment I would say that the economic benefits are clear that uh, it's makes this a place people want to live uh, it's something that is sought after. Um, trails are the number one sought after amenity for the county parks, and we have over 800 miles of them, and they need a lot of maintenance, and they're always building reroutes and building new trail systems. Montgomery Parks has a dedicated trail crew, um, and that isn't cheap. Uh, so in order to keep the trails in best shape uh, and preserve these am amazing parks, I would ask that you fully fund the parks budget. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Anna White. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Anna White, and my testimony today is on behalf of the North Woodside Citizens Association. We join the adjacent civic associations of Littonsville and Rosemary Hills in supporting full funding in the CIP of the Littonsville Civic Green, also known as the future Littonsville Neighborhood Park. This beautifully designed park and the bridge memorial made from the steel girders of the historic Tablet Avenue Bridge, a main feature of it, will contribute to a more racially inclusive public narrative of our county's history and serve as a unique cross-bridge community gathering space. The park will also provide vital green space in an area where vast numbers of trees have been clear cut for purple line construction. For more details regarding our support for this park, please see our written testimony. We also support full funding for the renovation of nearby Rosemary Hills Littonsville Local Park, which will soon become more accessible to our residents with the opening of the new Talbot Avenue Bridge. We commend Montgomery Parks for expanding its community input process to include residents of adjacent apartments and updating the park's design accordingly. Equitable outreach takes extra time, effort, and funds and in a demographically diverse county such as ours, it is especially important. Funding for these parks will come from various portions of the park's budget, which has been reduced 5% in the proposed CIP from that re requested. This puts in jeopardy sufficient funds for these parks and many other worthy parks of park funding needs throughout the country, a county. Our county's parks are free of charge to enter, open to all, 
and offer so much to so many. Take a moment to reflect on what life would be like without our parks. They are our community third spaces, our places to play and exercise, our spaces to gather, our outdoor classrooms, and more. They are the outdoor living rooms of our communities, a vital part of the fabric of our lives and our well being. They support our physical and mental health, our children's education, our understanding of our cultural and historical heritage, our community connection, and our environment. When it comes to parks, our association advocates not from a NIMBY perspective, not in my backyard, or a YIMBY perspective, yes, in my backyard, rather a YIBY perspective, yes, in everyone's backyard. We believe all county residents are deserving of access to well-designed and maintained parks. We acknowledge there are many other important items in the CIP, boosting affordable housing, teacher salaries, and climate-friendly initiatives. As you weigh the many and varied needs of our county, we urge you to restore full funding for Montgomery Parks, if at all possible. While it amounts to just 5% of the CIP, the value of our public parks to the well-being of our county's residents now and in the future is truly beyond measure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Melissa Weidenhofer. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Weidenhofer, and I'm the Community Health Manager for WOMCO Health, the nonprofit organization that offers emergency assistance and access to health care and other necessary um, services in the five zip codes that make up the western part of Up County, primarily in the Ag Reserve. I'm here to voice support for the Poolsville Area Community Center that's been included in the upcoming CIP budget. WUMCO clients will be served well by the clinic space. As you may know, healthcare access is a challenge to, for many of our residents in our part of the county, which has the worst health outcomes of any zip code in the county. WUMCO has been working for nearly two years, offering local access to healthcare in the area and has already seen this effort transforming county residents' lives. To date, we have logged 464 clinical encounters involving one-on-one -on -one care with a partner practitioner. We currently have a pop-up primary care partner, a mobile dental partner, and DHS has just started bringing their mobile health team to the area. We've established the need um, exists for primary care, dental, and mental health services for lower income and homebound residents. We're also seeing that while pop-up clinics have their place and are useful, more people would make use of them if we had legitimate clinic space in a professional environment that affords them the respect and dignity they deserve. We've made great strides utilizing mobile and pop-up services and would love to invite you to literally build on what we've already got going as a very good thing. Building a community center with permanent clinic space would allow regular and ongoing care that is not dependent on other competing events in spaces in churches that we're currently using. Dedicated clinic space would be more inviting to potential provider partners, creating the opportunity for mo more robust and consistent services, especially in certain specialty areas. We see this community center, or community center clinic space as a significant benefit to our community. We can essentially plug and play our prep work and experience with the services that now exist and insert them into the space. We've already identified potential clients, uncovered what needs exist, and developed relationships with provider partners. We look forward to the opportunity to be part of a unique and effective public-private partnership. Beyond the clinic space itself, the community center will provide or will improve the health of our community overall with use of spaces for fighting isolation with socialization, trading sedentary hours for active ones, and keeping bodies and minds healthy, active, and engaged. We ask for your support for the community center and clinic space in the CIP budget, and then come back next month with your support for the proposed rural health initiative in the upcoming FY25 operating budget as well, so we can continue to build on a fantastic public-private partnership with you. Thank you, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Wiedenhofer. Uh, our next speaker on this panel, Dave Miguel. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Dave Miguel. I'm the Maryland Advocacy Director for MORE. Uh, many of you know the organization, but we have about 2,000 members in the area. We take care of about 900 miles of trails throughout the area. Um, <coughs> we, uh, we put in about 1,000 hours of volunteer work on the trails in Montgomery County just in the last two years. Um, the, uh, a lot of it is maintenance. Um, this year, uh, the county uh, had a turnover in its volunteer coordinator, but our members stepped up 
And I will tell you, I think the trails had in 2023 were about as well maintained as they've ever been. We put together programs with the uh, uh, with the uh, county uh, to um, to allow our members to use battery powered hedge trimmers to clear all the vegetation that grows. Um, and it's made a big difference. Our club puts thousands of dollars into the hands of these trained volunteers. Um, why am I talking about maintenance at a capital budget program? Bottom line is while we can do a lot to maintain the trails, um, they, we can't actually build the kind of trails that are being done now. It requires machine operation. <clears throat> we can help. We do help. Uh, some of that time is, is supporting your group. Um, there's still a lot more to be done. Um, there are uh, the e there's been progress in the East County, a considerable progress. But really, oh, it's only about five years ago that the Parks Department got serious about building out the trail capabilities in the East County. So there's a real unevenness still in the in the county. Um, <clears throat> adaptive cycling is growing, and adaptive trails are coming. They will require s some smoothing. We're, we're, we're about to do an inventory of all the trails to find out which can be upgraded to allow uh, the disabled better access to our, our facilities. So I ask you to please reinstate, fully fund uh, the, the parks budget and, uh, the, uh, and particularly the trails program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGill. Our next panel is Patricia Tyson, Raul Ortiz, Catherine Gaudet, Lee Kaiser, and Linda Greenwald. Ms. Tyson, when you're ready, you have three minutes. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for giving uh, me this opportunity to speak for our community of Littonsville. We've come a long way, and this park is very special to us. We're, and now we were, we were, um, African-American community, and now we're an international community. Our roots planted something very deep here that we wanted others to experience with us. And I guess God was gracious in allowing us to do a number of things that we didn't think were going to bring people together as it has. Many of the other neighborhoods have parks, and they probably are named after people. This, this park doesn't have a name yet because it's a park that we pray will bring people together. We, we, we look at this park as more or less an overcoming place that people can meditate and hopefully get together. I see you call it a civic green. It will be a place where our civic community can come together can do things together. It's not a dog park. It's not a big park for a lot of amusement. This park is a serious park of the heart. This park has, a, has, a, has two tremendous elements in it. First, the Talbot Avenue Bridge, which connected two sides of the railroad track together in the days of segregation. This park as men and women who were born in, in the community um, not having all the amenities that the other communities had didn't stop us from thriving and making something of ourselves. This park is going to be uh, on Talbot Avenue where, a fam where families used to live, but we weren't even scheduled to have a park. It was just that the Purple Line didn't need this area that they had designated for a transmitter, and they gave it to our community to have what we wanted there, which is a park. This is a place that people can come, 
people can relax. People can know about the history of this park. And so I thank you today for this opportunity and I pray that you will fund this park so that it can be used for what it has been created to be, a place that brings people together. And we've overcome that ordeal of segregation. We're together and that's why you see these other communities testifying for this park today. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate you being here. Our next speaker is Raul Ortiz. Thank you, Council. Um, thank you for hearing us and thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm a teacher at uh, Damascus High School. Uh, my name is Raul Ortiz. Uh, it's been made known to us uh, at Damascus that the automotive program will be closing down in the renovation, which was kind of a big surprise for us. Um, uh, Montgomery County has uh, decided to close the program because apparently our numbers are too low. Um, but uh, the impact that we have on the community and in the area is, is too big. Um, one of the things that they were saying is that uh, we have only 64 students, but for safety reasons, we have to have a class that's only a certain amount of size. Um, Montgomery County, I know they're going through a lot of issues right now, but uh, a lot of things. Um, but we, we want to make sure that, that we're heard. Um, and I know that you guys control the budget for Montgomery County um, schools. And uh, one of the things that they proposed for us was to have the students uh, brought down to Seneca Valley, uh, which is uh, travel time for the students. So they'll be out of school, um, not, not participating in any class. That's a half hour down, half hour back. That's an hour. Plus, they they would be um, um, bus down there, which we don't have the buses. We don't have the drivers. Um, it's it's been a real big problem the last couple of years with uh, hiring the bus drivers. Uh, so it's it's a it's a situation that we have uh, that we really need to kind of pursue a little bit. Um, uh, I'm trying to go through my notes here. Um, the the county, um, they're not counting our students correctly. Are also uh, because I have 64 students. That doesn't mean I have just 64 students because my periods are double periods. So it really counts as 100, uh, 124 students or 20, 28 students. Um, so when you count it that way, it's the numbers are, are good and, you know, they need to, yeah, we can do more. We, we actually turned away a lot of students this year because I don't have the room in the classroom or for the safety reason. Um, the other thing is, is uh, with Montgomery County, um, we are trying to make sure that the MSD standards are all met, So, um, which is the... Um, Maryland State Board of Education, that all their count, the statements are all um, met, and with our program, we actually meet all their their um, certifications and stuff. I thank you again. I know I ran out of time. Thank you again. It's it's a it's a real pleasure to come and talk to you guys. And uh, if there's anything, I do have a packet of emails uh, from community um, that I like to present to the. Uh, you Appreciate guys. it. You can drop it off with the thank clerk, you. and yeah. uh, she'll make sure that we see it. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Our next speaker is Catherine Gaudet. Hello. I'm Catherine Gaudet, a resident of Silver Spring and a regular visitor to Montgomery County Parks. I'm a weed warrior. I ride mountain bikes, hike, walk paved trails, attend farmers markets and festivals, and I love spending time outside in a wide variety of our wonderful parks. At a party the other day, I told a teacher that I sometimes feel bad asking for money for parks when I know schools need so much. And she turned and looked me in the eye and said, um, parks are just as important as education, especially these days. You're doing the right thing. And someone else added, our parks are a big reason people move to and stay in this county. So here I am asking you to please not make such drastic cuts to next year's budget. 
Our parks are a vital asset to our county, especially with its rapidly growing population. They are the backyard for everyone living in condos and apartments. They are the playgrounds and sports fields for all the kids and adults. They are programs and camps, meeting places and training areas. For mountain biking, people come to Montgomery County to ride our awesome trails. And almost no one rides without going out to eat afterwards at a local restaurant. And we buy gas and Gatorade and snacks nearby and spend money. There's a special bike ride every October called the MoCo Epic. It brings over a thousand people from all over Maryland and many other states to Germantown and they to ride up to 70 miles um, on well-groomed, fun, contiguous dirt trails that go from the Potomac River up to Damascus and back. What a great way to see the county. As a weed warrior, I'm part of Corinne Stevens' volunteer army that fans out over Montgomery Parks, trying to keep the relentless invasives at bay. There's a team working somewhere almost daily. It's a never-ending battle that needs to be fought to preserve all those trees so necessary to fight climate change. We must preserve our trees and parks. I'm very passionate about our parks, but I'll stop here, and I hope you please reconsider and restore the budget for Montgomery County's GEMS. The staff and infrastructure are so important for the county's quality of life now and even more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next speaker, Lee Kaiser. Good afternoon, President Freeds and Vice President Stewart and council members. I am Lee Kaiser and was a pre-pandemic president of the South Bradley Hills Neighborhood Association in District 1. My comments today are my own. The county executive's new FY25 through 30 capital improvements program recommendations have heightened my concerns about transparency, trust, and timeliness. My case study is the Bradley Boulevard MD191 Improvements Project P501733, where a dual zip code last mile community bisected by the two-lane Bradley Boulevard. This project would fill a three-quarter mile sidewalk gap between MD188 and MD614. Where is transparency lacking? In the County Office of Management and Budget CIP justification, the Bradley Boulevard project's origins in the BCC Master Plan of 1990 are omitted. OMB cites only the 2018 Bicycle Master Plan as if this 30-year-old proposal were new. As OMB's capital budget book represents the public CIP gateway, omitting citations to all relevant master plans may mislead the public or misinform decision makers. Transparency is also lacking in the OMB images. Bradley Boulevard's proximity to the Capitol Crescent Trail, schools, and to a greenway to the library are not visible. The pedestrian master plans, more comprehensive level of comfort maps, should be featured with CIP project maps. Why is trust eroding? The Bradley Boulevard project is stuck in final design stage. The corridor features a three-quarter mile gap in sidewalks and a single marked crosswalk. Construction was scheduled for completion in FY27, but now may be delayed into the next decade. In his October 2018 Council Staff Report on the Bicycle Master Plan, then Deputy Director Dr. Glenn Orlin, now newly retired, advocated that the Bradley Boulevard project advance to a Tier 1 priority within that plan. He wrote, each of the projects is in the CIP because it has a constituency and the Council has committed to implement them. Bradley Boulevard is on Tier 1, but why should we trust Montgomery County to ever deliver basic infrastructure in this heavily traveled corridor when the Bradley CIP construction phase is repeatedly postponed? Timeliness, county DOT public meetings on the Bradley Boulevard project occurred in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2015, and 2021, with ever-increasing community participation and support, including from President Friedson and Councilmember Glass. Meanwhile, a contiguous safety project, P507017, will add dedicated left turn lanes to the intersection of Bradley Boulevard and MD188. Construction may begin there in 2025. With utility poles recently relocated, efficiency would likely be realized if the adjacent Bradley Boulevard sidewalk construction were accelerated. In conclusion, one step forward, two steps back, plagues the Bradley Boulevard CIP. The county executive's latest recommendation would delay its construction into the next decade at ever-increasing cost, further eroding public trust and the value of our taxpayer dollars. Most significantly, the longer the P501733 is stuck in final design stage, the greater risk that remains for all travelers along this busy two-lane state road corridor. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Greenwald. Good afternoon, Council President and members of the County Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Linda Greenwald. I am the Rosemary Hills Neighbors Association President. 
I speak today to urge you to fully fund the Montgomery County Parks budget. Parks are an essential service. They contribute greatly to the well-being of individuals and communities. Montgomery County has 420 parks providing this essential service. To remain vibrant, individuals and communities need tender, loving care, and so does the park system. Housing in Montgomery County is becoming more densely built, more multifamily, probably more rented than owned with less space for cars. We will have less personal space and likely see less green space around us. We will need parks nearby to see wooded areas, green space, playing fields, courts, trails, and wildlife. Parks will become even more essential for the well-being of Montgomery County residents. We look forward to the development of the beautifully designed Littonsville Civic Green, which will also serve as a remembrance of the Talbot Avenue Bridge and the significant significance it played during the days of segregation. A local park is a draw for home builders, but less so if it is not well maintained and improved over the years. Our park has been in need of some tender loving care. Then, out of the blue last year, our state delegate, Jared Solomon, secured funding towards the renovation of our local Rosemary Hills Lintonsville Park. We greatly appreciate Delegate Solomon's support of parks. He gets it. I also appreciate the park planners who I got to know during their months-long process of community outreach. They developed a community-pleasing plan for improving our park. They get it. I and mem many members, I'm sorry, I and many neighbors frequent our park with its rolling hills and beautiful trees. You can play a sport, watch a game, meander through, meet someone you know, or meet someone new. Many who live near our park are originally from another country. Our paths to this one of 420 Montgomery County parks might be quite different. But one thing that we share is that it improves, it improves our well-being. You get it. Parks are essential. Please fully fund the parks budget. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate this panel. Our next panel is Raymond Heinzman, Francine Walker, Amy Ackerberg Hastings, Maria Briankin, and Tracy Rulo. Please join us at the table, and when you are ready, Raymond Heinzman, you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Ray Heisman, and I live in Forest Glen. I really appreciate having the opportunity to support the Planning Board and Montgomery Parks fiscal year 25 to 30 CIP request, and that would help the parks deliver critical projects to encourage physical activity, social connections, environmental stewardship, and maintain our 420 parks in great condition. I am especially excited to help implement the updated Wheaton Regional Park Master Plan, of which I was a community volunteer in the master planning team. I object strongly to the County Executive Mark Elric's request to reduce the budget, uh, and here is why. When it comes to parks, Montgomery County receives a huge contribution from the community. One example, small one, this month, our Cub Scout PAC 466 will be participating in a Sweep the Creek volunteer event on February 24th, where we will also have educational programming about the watershed. As another example, I recently helped Moore apply for a Maryland D Department of Transportation grant for Northwest Branch Trail to improve connections between neighborhoods, and we got it. As a result, it means more work for me, and, <laughs> and volunteer work at that. As a liaison between Moore and Montgomery Parks, we will lead volunteers in building and maintaining that trail. We do this because of what we see as the result of providing spaces like this to our community. These are spaces that can be used by everyone, every day, all day. It is not something that requires reservations or memberships. We are all welcome. In skate parks, bike parks, trail systems, and playgrounds, I see people cheering for each other, supporting each other, forging new friendships. The community cultivated by this type of investment is one that cares about one another, encourages self-improvement, 
and celebrates creativity. Support for these things shows we support people over products, connection over isolation, physical and mental health over instantaneous gratification, earth over profit, and generosity over selfishness. I choose to live here because here I am among a community who share a goal of empathetically and compassionately making our community better for everyone. Supporting the park shows that our county council does too. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Francine Walker. Hello, I'm Francine Walker, a proud resident of Gaithersburg and board member at Rebuilding Together Montgomery County. Rebuilding Together's mission is to provide free critical home repairs and accessibility modifications to the county's most vulnerable homeowners, including seniors, veterans, people with disabilities, and struggling families with children. This year, Rebuilding Together celebrates our 34th anniversary. To date, we have served 3,500 low-income families, impacting over 8,000 individuals and galvanizing more than 55,000 community volunteers in our neighbor, helping neighbor approach. On behalf of the thousands of community members served by our organization, we are grateful for this county's long-term financial support. We are the premier local nonprofit, 100% devoted to the preservation of existing affordable housing. We do not construct new homes. Instead, we help the rarely recognized low-income homeowners who are in desperate need of critical repairs to ensure they can remain safely in their homes. For example, we recently made accessibility modifications for a 96-year-old Poolsville veteran who is now aging safely at home. Thanks to Montgomery County's new HARP funding, we will provide accessibility modifications to even more vulnerable homeowners across the county. In addition to assisting individual income qualified homeowners, Rebuilding Together has forged partnerships to help nonprofits with their property rehabilitation needs. While the need for our services has never been greater, our cost for materials has risen dramatically and we have had to rely on more paid contractors. Because of Montgomery County's support, thousands of county residents are living safely in their homes. This year, we are on pace to serve an additional 180 families impacting over 400 residents. To address this backlog of homeowners in desperate need of help, we request and thank you for continuing our annual funding. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Amy Ackerberg Hastings. Good afternoon, President Friedson, members of the County Council, and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the CIP allocation for MCPS. My name is Amy Ackerberg Hastings, and I am the parent of a Richard Montgomery High School sophomore, as well as one of the MCCPTA cluster coordinators for the seven RM cluster PTSAs. Our community asks for full funding of MCPS's request for the fiscal year 2025 to 2030 CIP. Two major capital projects are of special interest to our cluster. First, the construction of Crown High School must remain on track for completion in 2027. All but one of the schools expected to see Crown student body are significantly over capacity, creating negative effects on student experiences. For example, the nine portable classrooms at Richard Montgomery take up parking lot space and inhibit accessibility to the building and stadium. Every fall, nearly 100 boys compete for 40 JV and varsity soccer spots, leaving out 60 players who would have increased opportunities to play if Richard Montgomery had more high schools. Second, Twinbrook Elementary School's overdue renovation is one of the five new major capital projects that seem likely to be targeted for, by the cost reductions requested by the council. Twinbrook is a Title I and community school with a 72.4% farms rate and 182 students requiring English language development services. The 72-year-old building last had a renovation in 1986, and that, are, that work arguably made the school more unsafe and dysfunctional, even by the standards of 38 years ago. Although MCPS has made several much appreciated individual improvements and repairs in recent years, the remaining problems are serious and intractable. 
They include a lack of fire suppression sprinklers, impeded sight lines for security down the building's oddly con connected four wings, dozens of doorways too narrow for ADA regulations, and uneven elevations both outside and inside the building. Last fall, ailing third grade students on the building's lower level twice needed a wheelchair, but the school nurse was unable to get one to them because there is no chairlift or elevator. Meanwhile, a January 2024 working paper issued by Barbara Biasi's research team affirms that capital investments in schools with socioeconomically disadvantaged populations are correlated with increased test scores. In fact, they provide evidence that such spending may close up to 25% of the observed achievement gap in these schools. Furthermore, they discovered that these building projects actually preserve the affordability of housing in their neighborhoods. In short, Modernizing Title I school buildings is money well spent. You can find additional details about Twinbrook and Crown in the written testimony I submitted separately. Again, our cluster urges the Council to find the necessary county revenues to fully fund MCPS's request for the FY25-30 to CIP. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Maria Briancon. Hello. My name is Maria Brion Song. Brion Song, sorry. I'm president I knew, of as I said it, I knew that, and I apologize. <laughs> no problem. President of Poolsville Area Senior Center, Inc., also known as Poolsville Seniors. I am so happy to be with you today, and thanks for this opportunity to address the County Council regarding a proposed community center for Poolsville. We're the only private nonprofit organization of its type in Montgomery County with a program for seniors ages 50 plus within 15 miles of Poolsville. We also serve the surrounding areas, providing seniors opportunities to stay physically, mentally, socially active and engaged. Thanks to the County Community Grants Program, coupled with Poolsville Town Funds and our community's generosity, gosh, we're so lucky, we accomplish a lot all despite the fact that we lack a permanent home and we do not have access to public transportation. We have about 1,000 subscribers to our weekly blog and we provide over 650 free activities annually to meet our mission's goals. We're grateful for the extensive use of Poolsville Presbyterian Church's Spear Hall, but the location is limiting. We meet four days a week, along with several times a month, and it's putting a strain on the church's resources. We're outgrowing the space. 30 of us cram into a limited space for line dancing. Parking overflow when there's more than 50 cars becomes an issue. We share this space with other nonprofits. Sometimes Spear Hall is booked, forcing us to seek out costlier options. Pickleball is popular, but costly. We rent space five days a week during the winter to accommodate over 100 registered players, nine of which who won gold in last year's Maryland Senior Olympics. Ag Reserve life can be isolating for seniors. In a recent county zip code study, Poolsville ranked last for overall health outcomes, and the death rate for those 65 plus was much higher than other areas. A community center would give seniors more option to keep them healthy and look what LUMCO is accomplishing, providing dental and health clinic opportunities to those living in remote areas. Our aging seniors deal with a lot. They're combating their own frailties brought on by an increasingly sedentary lifestyle. They have declining eyesight, making it difficult to drive distances. Some are caretakers for their own parents, a spouse, or even their children's children. A health clinic in Poolsville would provide on-site first aid, address rehabilitative needs, and continuity of care. Residents could address issues before they become more serious and costly. We're asking you for this community center, varied and group exercise options, complete with equipment storage space for seniors to improve physical and mental health, a place to store tables here, chairs, games, arts and crafts supplies, and a warming kitchen for nutritional and social purposes. We have close to 1,800 residents who have either used or expressed interest in our program. Imagine how rewarding it would be if they could have their own place to call home. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Next speaker is Tracy Rouleau. Good afternoon, um, Council Member Friedson, uh, Council Members, uh, Council President Friedson, sorry, <laughs> Council Members and staff. My name is Tracy Rouleau. I'm on the Steering Committee for Stormwater Partners Network. I'm also the chair of the Montgomery County Water Quality Advisory Group, though my testimony today is solely representing Stormwater Partners. As a network, our mission is to advocate for clean water, protecting and improving and restoring our watersheds in ways that are equitable and ecologically sensitive, and improving community resilience to stormwater impacts such as storm-driven flooding and connecting communities to their backyard waterways. I'll give you the bottom line up front. I'm here for parks. Um, we'd like to request that the council fully re uh, fund the CIP budget items for Montgomery Parks, specifically the $14.5 million for the Stream Valley Park projects and $8.8 .8 million for the MS4 requirements. I love being a resident here in Montgomery County. When I first moved here 17 years ago, my children were little. Um, I would often take them out into my local Stream Valley Park, the Muddy Branch Park, uh, to walk the trails, paddle in the creek, or just sit and enjoy peace and solitude. It was time well spent and something I always couldn't do in places that I had lived previously. My children aren't little anymore, uh, but some of their best memories took place in Montgomery Parks, those amazing oases that in this very busy county that bring woods and water and people together. What worries me, however, is climate change. We aren't completely certain of the impacts that changing climate will bring, but we do know that our region is expected to see more frequent and more intense precipitation, bigger and badder downpours and rainstorms. And we're already seeing those impacts. Sadly, we've already had our first climate fatality due to flooding. Stream Valley parks are already at risk for flooding. They are floodplains. So much of our park's infrastructure, trails, paths and bridges, recreational equipment, and facilities are within these parks, and the problem is only expected to get worse. We need to get ahead of the impacts from climate change and continue to invest in the health and resilience of our streams and the parks that surround them, not pull back. These parks are one of the best lines of defense that we have against the continued impacts of climate change. They are natural infrastructure, literally designed to withstand flooding. It's what they do. Fully funding the CIP budget for Montgomery Parks will help our really amazing parks personnel to leverage these natural flood control system, these ready-made climate solutions, and to improve them. We urge you to restore the $24 million cut from the park CIP budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speakers who are here in person, Jacob Lee, Matthew Ariola. And I don't believe Nadine Medley is here. If she's arrived, please join us. But if not, let's go ahead. Jacob Lee, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jacob Lee, and I'm a student at Poolsville High School. So recently, County Executive Mark Ellerich released his recommended capital budget and FY25 to FY30 CIP, which included a community center for the town of Puzo. I'd like to share with you the transformative impact that a community center can have, particularly from the perspective of a young athlete, out of area student, junior class SGA member, and part of the science, math, and computer science program at Puzo. As someone who stays an extra period after school every day and dedicates many hours on top of that as a member of my school's basketball team, I've come to realize the potential value of a supportive and accessible community center. The benefits of a community center for student athletes are many fold. Playing high school sports means maintaining peak physical condition both in season and out. Having a dedicated fitness center in Puzo would be a game changer, and access to state-of-the-art equipment and professional guidance will elevate our training regimens, ensuring that we perform at our best when representing our schools. Moreover, a community center with open fields and a gym will provide sports teams with essential spaces for both off-season and in-season workouts. Currently, we find ourselves scrambling to secure suitable venues, impacting the continuity and quality of our training. 
I know specifically for the Pouzel varsity basketball team, we are often forced to hold practices at varying times and in different places, like John Poole Middle School or the Pouzel Baptist Church. With the communities with the community center's proposed gym, with enough space for two teams to practice at once, we could establish a consistent and conducive environment for improving our skills. Beyond the athletic realm, a community center offers spaces for academic and personal growth. The majority of students at Pouzel High School are out of area with commute times up to over an hour. This makes travel extremely inconvenient for students staying for after school events. A community center will provide a safe space with trusted adults for students to unwind, complete assignments, or get some physical activity in without having to travel all the way home. In addition, students of the Science, Math, and Computer Science program have an extra period which ends at 325 and are forced to take the activity bus home, which does not arrive until 430. This means we spend nearly nine hours a day at school, longer than the average workday in the U.S. The community center will provide a physical barrier from the school, allowing for a mental reset from academia. In conclusion, the establishment of a community center is not just about constructing physical spaces. It's about investing in the well-being, growth, and cohesion of our community. I realize this project will not be completed until I'm long gone from this school, but it will make a lasting impact on the Pouzel community. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for being here for your testimony. Our last in-person speaker here today, Matthew Ariola. Hi, good afternoon, Council. Um, my name is Matthew Ariola. I work for um, uh, the, uh, the Automotive Trades Foundation, uh, Montgomery County Public Schools, also the uh, Trades Foundation office that supports construction, automotive, IT, and uh, hotel management. Okay, um, Back in November, we were very shocked to hear that Damascus was when Damascus is remodeled they're not going to build an automotive program okay I can tell you that it's going to be absolutely detrimental to our students okay the 12 years that I've worked for the county I have seen many students pass through this program that have said to me you know Mr. Areola if we didn't have this program I wouldn't come to school okay we've touched many many lives with this program including myself I'm a 1995 graduate of Sherwood High School I went through the program when I was in high school moved on to be a GM certified technician and then decided to come back to MCPS and become a teacher um, we've also we've also they've also told us that okay well if we do build a, a space for you guys it's going to be much much smaller Okay, and that just won't do. We can't. We cannot teach kids out of a textbook a hands-on trade. Okay, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but right now our country has a one million person shortage of automotive technicians. Okay, if we discontinue this program, it's going to hurt. Like I said, it's going to hurt our communities and our students. Okay, so if Damascus does decide to build an automotive space. It needs to be at least the same size it is now or bigger so we can handle the demands of the students in the community. Okay? Uh, one of the best sales that we have up at Damascus, you know, the sense of community in Damascus is this, I've never seen anything. Like it's like it's like a small hometown feel. It's one of my favorite sales that we have with the students. And just seeing that disappear would be detrimental, you know. So I said what I said. I I want to just make it quick, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We're going to turn to virtual, starting with Artie Duranasi. Thank you. Greetings, County Council members. I am Dr. Artie Patel Varanasi and appreciate and welcome this opportunity to share my strong opposition to the budget cuts that will result in further delays to the Damascus High School renovations and subsequently overcrowding at Clarksburg High School. I come before you today as a parent of a fifth grade student at Wilson Williams Elementary School, an up county resident for more than 20 years, a local and county PTA leader, scientist and public health professional. Having lived in Germantown and now Clarksburg, I have watched over the years as projects in other parts of the county are prioritized. Our Clarksburg community has experienced significant growth in population with new homes built in the past two decades. However, this housing boom has not been accompanied by supporting infrastructure, including promised establishments like a community center, aquatic center, library, and other services. After attending the second community meeting on the Damascus High School renovation at the end of last year, I was hopeful. 
It seemed that the upcounty voices were finally being heard and our concerns taken seriously. Everything seemed to be back on track with the renovation project and the community members and staff present were excited about the project and progress. However, I was unable to attend the third community meeting and subsequently learned that serious consideration is being given to delaying the Damascus High School renovation project yet again. This is simply not acceptable. I understand the conditions and learning environments at Damascus High School continue to deteriorate and the renovations are needed now. We are asking our students and staff to flourish in an environment that is subpar. The conditions that the students and staff are forced to learn and work in is a public health and educational equity issue. Additionally, each day the renovations are delayed impacts students and overcrowding at Clarksburg High School. Let's work together in setting up our students for success. It is time for our county leadership to show that they hear the voices of all of our county residents equitably and to focus on efforts in moving forward the Damascus High School renovation project and reducing overcrowding at Clarksburg High School. The existing and continued housing development of Clarksburg will result in a continued overcrowding and the use of portables at Clarksburg High School. There are already 14 portables there. The lack of expansion at Damascus High School means more students at Clarksburg High School with the potential to add more portables to accommodate the population in the future. In the past week, we have received almost 100 signatures to our sign-on letter advocating for support for continuing with the renovation project. Please expect to receive letters from individual residents and hear testimony from other parents and community members. I implore you to think of our students and support their education and future in creating an environment where all will flourish. Please join us in creating a healthy and safe environment for our students, staff, and community. And I urge you to move forward with the Damascus High School renovation project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker, Joel Teitelbaum. Um, good afternoon, council members. On this glorious afternoon in Montgomery County, where, where uh, I am sitting in front of a window looking out on the greenery and, and forested area of the local Rosemary Hills, Littonsville local park. I wish you were here instead of in that chamber, but some other time. I'm we here to support, to support the, uh, the full-fledged full budget of the Parks Department and, 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 to, and, and to ask for the, the restored, restoring of all the funds that may um, be taken away. I speak as an individual. Uh, I'm 84 years old. I've lived in the county for over 50 years, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the local parks that need the most attention in the county. Specifically, a future park, which Pat Tyson, my neighbor, uh, spoke to most eloquently, the future Littonsville Civic Green or Littonsville Neighborhood Park, which will be a historic uh, addition to Littonsville and our entire neighborhood. In fact, we call ourselves Greater Lintonsville since many of our subdivisions uh, were built around the originally founded African American community of Lintonsville. I, I would also like to support and back what others have said regarding the Rosemary Hills Lintonsville uh, local park uh, restoration and improvement plan. This plan was recently worked out with the park's planners. Uh, there was a great deal of community input, and after a period of hemming and hawing, the planners really did uh, reach out and survey the community and found that even low-income immigrant um, uh, residents in apartments want the same things that the single-family homeowners want in our mixed neighborhood. We want the greenery. We want the reforestation of a somewhat dilapidated park. We need to have accessibility, particularly ADA accessibility to the trails and improvement in the trails. And we desperately need stormwater management that works due to the undulating nature of this park on a hill that, that um, is a tributary to Rock Creek Park. We had quite a bit of stormwater flooding in, in recent years. 
And finally, I'd like to, to say one thing about the change that I've seen in the, in, in the Parks Department since the new Planning Board Chair was appointed, the new commissioners, and I very much appreciate the parks as a way to live in this county. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're also very jealous of your view. Uh, next speaker, Jeffrey Resnick. Hi, good afternoon to the council. Uh, council President Friedson, thank you very much. Uh, and also greetings to Council Member Litke, a District 7's direct representative to the council, and uh, to our council members, Albernoz, uh, Glass, Duwando, uh, and Sales, our uh, at-large representatives. Uh, my name is Jeff Resnick. It's a privilege to speak with you briefly this afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the county executive's recommended CIP especially his proposal for uh, $1 million in the upcoming FY25 and uh, $2.5 million uh, in FY26 uh, for the long-expected and much-needed relocation of the MCPS bus depot located on Crabs Branch Way. Um, I do urge uh, sincerely the Council to support this recommendation in order to advance its own approved plan for the Shady Grove sector plan per uh, Montgomery planning. Um, moreover, uh, I'd like to remind the Council uh, that uh, 850 uh, individuals, more than 850, uh, have to date signed our community's uh, move on petition urging you, uh, along with the County Executive and MCPS, to um, collaborate in moving forward with the Shady Grove sector plan and getting it uh, finally done. Uh, your support of the County Executive's recommended CIP is therefore essential. Uh, as is the county executive's own continued commitment to completing this important project for the central part of the county in cooperation with MCPS. And my community and I thank you very much. Um, while I'm on the subject of MCPS, I'd like to add that I urge you please, and MCPS, to keep uh, the Magruder High School major capital project uh, squarely on schedule uh, as proposed in the county executive's uh, recommended CIP. Uh, while I understand that the Board of Education may need to identify what are called non-recommended delays in order to get the uh, school system's capital budget in order, uh, I and many other MCPS families would find such recommendations unacceptable. But simply, we do uh, expect the county to pursue its stated investment in Magruder, uh, if not invest in the school faster, uh, as part of their overall strategic investment in the central part of the county, which, in the eyes of myself and many of my neighbors, continues to languish unacceptably, while other areas uh, and schools of the county grow and flourish uh, through taxpayer dollars and private investment. Um, thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak to these two key uh, aspects of the CIP. Uh, I appreciate your time, your expertise, and certainly also your public service uh, in addressing these aspects and certainly all you, that you do. Uh, it is a privilege and I thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Eva Santorini. Hello, my name is Eva Santorini. My husband and I have lived in the Rosemary Hills section of Silver Spring since 1988. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to offer public testimony on a subject that continues to be near and dear to my weed warrior heart, our beautiful Montgomery County Parks. I support the full funding of all of our parks. We live around the corner from Rosemary Hills Littonsville Park, which had been popular and loved for its open green space long before we recognized its benefit during the COVID pandemic. It was then that we recognized the true value of being able to enjoy nature, get relief from isolation, and see neighbors, even if only from a safe distance. During the recent refresh of that park, I was involved in highlighting the need for long ignored maintenance issues, such as its soccer and athletic fields and treat care, considering cost-effective amenities to benefit all visitors, advocating for the valuable open space, and insisting that feedback included nearby apartment building residents. Our small group of concerned neighbors was very grateful when most, if not all of the issues were addressed at the December 2023 meeting at the Cofield Community Center. I appreciate the behind the scenes work by our District 18 team, headed especially by State Senators Jared Solomon and others who were responsible for identifying funds and who followed progress on the issues raised. Most importantly, the park will serve all residents as greater density is expected from housing construction adjacent to the future of Lindsville Station of the Purple Line. I offered testimony last fall for the Lindsville Civic Green, whose design was developed with great sensitivity by the park's designer, Cheng Fang Chen, with our community's input. 
I relayed my excitement for the transformation of that tiny parcel of land from a construction staging area for the Purple Line to a park in which local history is shared and celebrated. Girders from the historic Talbot Avenue Bridge will be placed in the park and remind visitors that bridges one that once divided communities now unite them. Those traveling along the adjacent Capitol Crescent Trail, whose mature trees were decimated in preparation for the Purple Line construction, whether on foot or on bicycle, will be able to rest in the green space and learn of the community's history. What a fitting location for the Lyttonsville Civic Green will be for the annual Talbot Avenue Bridge Lantern Walk in its sixth year in 2023, whose par where participants could begin and end their Unity Walk. I would like to show you our current Unity Lantern, which we use during the la Lantern Walk. A similar one was positioned on the center for the historic Talbot Avenue Bridge during its centennial birthday celebration in 2018. But this photograph by Rosemary Hills photographer Jay Mellon captures the moment in which representatives of Lyttonsville, North Woodside, and Rosemary Hills joined to light the lantern during the 2023 celebration. In closing, I would like to thank you for this opportunity and for all of those who are speaking up in support of the full funding of our beautiful and cherished Montgomery County Parks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Judith Danino. Danuno, sorry, excuse me. Good afternoon. My request is that the county restore the money allocated in the budget for parks. In particular, fully fund the Lyttonsville Civic Green. I also want to voice my support for the planned renovations of the Rosemary Hills Lyttonsville Local Park. In particular, the storm water management plans for the soccer field, the parking lot, and the improved pathways in the park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speakers, I don't believe that Solomon Mamo is here uh, online or Nicholas Spano. So we're going to move on to Mike Austin. Hopefully y'all can hear me all right here. I'm stuck in my truck today, so I apologize for that. Um, I just want to say my name is Mike Austin. Um, I'm here to represent um, the automotive department with Damascus High School. Um, I am a graduate of Damascus High School and a alumni of the automotive program. Um, Mr. Ortiz was actually my automotive teacher back in 2002 through 2004. Um, I currently work for Montgomery County Public Schools in the Department of Transportation fleet. And the option to be able to bus students from Damascus High School to Gaithersburg and or Seneca Valley is just not a great one. Um, coming from the Department of Transportation, I understand that bus drivers are at a very commodity right now. Um, and it's a, a operating cost to have to take those students from Damascus High School to another school, let alone have them be out of school in travel time for about an hour. Um, something that Mr. Ortiz did not mention is that school uh, is a uh, fully funded uh, or, or accredited dealership. So every vehicle that those students uh, are working on and learning from and repairing, they're also selling. So it is bringing funding back to MCPS and to Montgomery County. Um, not only is it just a great teaching place, but it is a great career starter. Um, I never thought that I would be working for Montgomery County Public Schools coming from Damascus High School in the program. The basic lessons I learned there and the true passion I gained from that program are second to none. Um, I think that it would be a travesty to have that program deleted from that area. There are 27 high schools within Montgomery County, and there are only four high schools that have an automotive program, one of them being uh, in uh, Edison Center, which is a dedicated program. So to remove one from Damascus High School would limit that tremendously for a ton of students. 
Um, so I strongly hope that you could either consider adding to the budget to be able to continue the automotive program or push Montgomery County Public Schools to reconsider the budget planning for the automotive program through Damascus High School. I appreciate y'all's time today and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Our next speaker, Kerry Kosicki. Good afternoon. My name is Kerry Kosicki. I'm the Montgomery Advocacy Manager for the Coalition for Smarter Growth, and we advocate for walkable, inclusive, and transit-oriented communities as the most sustainable and equitable way for our region to grow and provide opportunities for all. Um, we're very glad to see a major commitment to affordable housing production and preservation in the proposed budget, and we ask you to support recommended appropriations in full to the Housing Initiative Fund and the Nonprofit Preservation Fund. Providing robust funding to these initiatives must be a priority to make sure that we don't let opportunities to provide affordable housing slip through the cracks. The level of annual funding that's proposed in this year's CIP appropriately reflects the urgency and scale of our housing need, and it should represent a benchmark for future years. We also support the over $580 million in proposed funding to continue building out our planned BRT network. These investments are necessary to provide great bus service to people in our county who depend on it along major corridors and achieve our county's climate goals by making bus service fast, reliable, and convenient and a great alternative to driving. Going forward, we ask that the county continue to prioritize a fast, reliable, and convenient bus service and identify the most impactful and cost-effective ways to deliver better bus service to riders. To reduce emissions from vehicle travel, we also need to prioritize making our county a safe place for walking and biking. We're glad to see a strong commitment to Vision Zero in the CIP, including um, a proposed increase in funding for the neighborhood traffic calming effort, um, as well as funding for key pedestrian facility and bikeway projects, and we urge you to support these appropriations as well. Um, we'll also note, as many other speakers have, that the parks budget recommended in the CIP is about $24 million short of the request from the Parks Department. Um, this cut could threaten the Parks Department's ability to carry out important maintenance responsibilities and accessibility improvements, including Vision Zero safety improvements in parks. Uh, so we ask you to please support the full parks budget request. Uh, lastly, we want to highlight the importance of the Agricultural Land Preservation Easements Program, um, and we ask the Council to fully support this appropriation. The Ag Reserve is a unique and valuable resource, um, and as our county continues to grow and welcome new residents, our strategy, um, as we've outlined in Thrive, of focusing new housing and amenities in transit-oriented communities has to go hand-in-hand -hand with making concrete investments in protecting the Ag Reserve for the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker and final speaker of the public hearing is D. Travis Gallagher. President Freitz and, and members of the Montgomery County Council, I uh, thank you for your work and the confidence of allowing me to be the last speaker on this list. I, uh, I'm a county resident, homeowner, and parent. I work in science and engineering. Ten years ago, our neighborhood stream underwent a stream restoration project. I got to see firsthand how these projects go. At first, I was puzzled why huge old trees were being cut down and removed from the stream and which was then dredged and then rebuilt. Since then, I've seen other cases and I've studied the issues involved. On the one hand, we have impervious cover that conducts rainwater into streams, stressing them with erosion and pollution. On the other hand, we have tools to mitigate those harms, including so-called restorations. A few days ago, I walked over there and took pictures that I'd be happy to share. What's easy to see is that where big rocks have been placed, there are often places next to the rocks that are eroding. Also, there's a lot of synthetic fabric that was intended to retain sediment but has washed loose and exposed, fraying into the stream, clearly not maintaining its intended place or purpose. Furthermore, there are non-native plants overrunning the banks. I used to see salamanders, frogs, and turtles there, but not since the work was done. Every day we hear more about climate change. What can we in MoCo, one small county in a big wide world, do about that? One significant thing we can do is to recognize that these projects, with heavy equipment, removing big trees, and moving tons of dirt and rocks, have enormous carbon footprints so that they are no longer appropriate in the big picture. 
they do provide jobs to our neighbors and friends, but in most cases it would be better if we just gave them their salaries and asked them to spare the stream, spare the trees, hold off from the massive intervention with so many costs and downsides and no scientifically proven benefit. I don't question the good intentions, but let the folks understand that these projects are actually doing more harm than good, far more harm than good. Sure, there are spots where erosion is carving a cave under a road, and those should receive attention. But to rebuild and reroute a length of stream as a strategy to mitigate erosion downstream clearly doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. It has enormous costs beyond the expected disruptive impacts. Weighing the scant benefits against massive costs, these projects just don't make sense, and they should not be in our county budget. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. I don't believe any of the prior speakers who were not on earlier are currently on. And so with that, the public hearing is now closed. Thank you very much to everybody. We open up additional spaces this afternoon. We have additional spaces this evening and a quite a uh, significant number of speakers uh, as well. We'll have another public hearing Tomorrow, tonight's public hearing is at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be in recess until then uh, for the public hearing on the FY25 capital budget and FY25 to 30 capital improvements program. Just want to thank everybody for coming out. We heard Poolsville and Littonsville and the Weed Warriors and the Damascus Auto Program uh, and advocates for parks and trails in general and everybody from our community coming out and full force to speak to all the great amenities that we have and your support for building upon them as well. So thank you so much for that. And with that, colleagues, until 7 p.m. this evening, we are adjourned.